about this now. You drive through Cloverdale, they're talking about the tree sitters. I mean, people that never even heard of this stuff are talking about it. So we've had great success so far. Judy Berry and Daryl Cherney are Northern California organizers for Earth First, a radical environmental movement. For the past several years, they have led a campaign to save the last of California's old growth redwoods. They use the tactics of nonviolent confrontation. They are aggressive and outspoken. South Africa. But that's okay because we, you know, we'll defend ourselves and, you know, we, we can do it nonviolently as much as possible, but we're not going to stand by and take this shit from loggers. So today. <laughs> Judy Berry is a brilliant person and the most effective political organizer I've ever met. And I think when she arrived here, the alarm bells went off. I would imagine in the corporate boardrooms that finally there was a person here who was capable of organizing an effective resistance to corporate control of the timber resource. immediately Daryl didn't but I knew it because I felt it rip through me and it was an incredibly violent force and I felt it rip through my body I couldn't move I thought I was entirely paralyzed um, I knew that my body was ruined I, I never felt such pain I never knew such pain could exist and um, all I wanted to do was to die I heard some kids say that it's a bomb, it's a bomb. And then I realized that somebody had tried to make good on one of those death threats. May 24th, 1990, Oakland, California. Just before noon, a pipe bomb explodes in Judy Berry's car. With her is her friend and fellow organizer, Daryl Cherney. Ambulances rush them both to Highland Hospital. That night, police obtain a search warrant by telling a judge that Barry and Cherney are members of a violent terrorist group involved in the manufacture and placing of explosive devices. Police and FBI agents raid this house in Berkeley, where the two Earth First members had been to a meeting the night before. The police are looking for a bomb factory. They find nothing. But the next morning, police arrest Barry and Cherney. The decision to arrest uh, was based on the placement of the device in the vehicle, the nature of its construction, uh, physical and other evidence that we developed uh, by the investigators. For the next seven weeks, the police try to put together a case against Barry and Cherney. But Alameda County Assistant District Attorney Chris Carpenter declines to press charges, citing lack of evidence. I've never really believed that they were going to press charges myself because I knew that not only were Judy Barry and I innocent, but that we are victims of an act of terrorism. I'm, my greatest concern right now is that there's a maniac loose who could try again one year later the car bombing remains an unsolved case but both the fbi and the oakland police still consider barry and cherney suspects we haven't focused on anyone else in this case uh, uh, our position hasn't changed as far as barry and cherney goes they are still considered suspects was it your bomb were you carrying a bomb absolutely not I've been a nonviolent organizer for 20 years in various aspects of the movement, so it certainly doesn't fit in with my history. Even if one, and I hesitate to say this on television, but even if one were ignorant enough to believe that we were carrying this bomb, neither Judy Barry nor myself would be stupid enough to put it underneath the driver's seat. Barry and Cherney are now suing the Oakland police and the FBI for false arrest and libel. 
For the past six months, KQED has investigated this unsolved bombing. We have turned up new evidence and new suspects. We have discovered disturbing new information about anti-abortion extremists who made threats against Judy Berry. We have also uncovered attempts by logging companies to promote vigilante violence against Earth First saboteurs. I couldn't sit here and give you, yeah, I could too, I could sit here and give you names. Yeah, there were, damn right there were. And were there meetings of armed men basically discussing what to do about Earth First? Like every bar in the county. We have tracked down the man who convinced Judy Berry to pose with his Uzi semi-automatic rifle. And we have discovered an informant who infiltrated Earth First and sent false information about Judy Berry to the police. In the next hour, you'll learn what KQED's investigation has uncovered about who bombed Judy Berry. So I ask you now, who bombed Judy Berry? I know you're out there still. Have you seen her broken body? Or the spirit you can't kill? the spirit you can't kill. When Judy Berry and Daryl Cherney performed recently in a San Francisco church, the audience greeted them as martyrs, victims of an attempted murder. But when the bomb exploded last year, many people, including some environmentalists, assumed that Barry and Cherney were transporting their own bomb. That's partly because their group, Earth First, is a radical and controversial environmental movement with a reputation for tree spiking and other acts of sabotage they call monkey wrenching. Inspired by the late author Edward Abbey and his novel The Monkey Wrench Gang, Earth First was founded more than a decade ago by Dave Foreman and a small circle of his friends. Their motto, no compromise in defense of Mother Earth. Dave Foreman wrote and edited Eco Defense, a field guide to monkey wrenching, which describes how to destroy logging and mining equipment. Foreman himself goes on trial next month for allegedly plotting to knock down power lines in the Arizona desert. I think I'm here for one reason and one reason only. It's because I've been effective in mobilizing resistance to the destruction of this planet. I've been effective in opposing the short-term profit-making machinery of large corporations that want to chew the United States up. Earth First says their monkey wrenching is aimed only at property. The group does not advocate violence against people. It's definitely a militant group, and we use direct action, and we use confrontation, but we do not use violence. That's part of the credo of Earth First, is respect for all living things. And even if you look at the book Eco Defense, which is the main way that they try to condemn us, that book very strongly says, do not mess with explosives, do not mess with guns, things like that. But the police didn't buy that argument. Within hours after the bombing, they told the press that Barry must have known the bomb was in her car, because she put her guitar case on top of it. But the guitar case was barely damaged. Privately, in sworn testimony, police told a different story. According to the affidavit of Police Sergeant Robert Chenault, FBI agents at the scene advised him that the bomb was on the floorboard behind the driver's seat. Uh, but the, but, but the Barry's injuries indicate that the bomb was placed directly underneath her, according to the surgeon who treated her at Highland Hospital, Dr. Peter Slaybaugh. No injuries to her back? Don't remember any injuries to her back at all, no. So as far as you could see or recall at the time, the injuries were to her pelvic area, her buttocks? Yes, and looked like some sort of force that kind of came up from below. 
We examined what remains of Barry's Subaru station wagon with one of her defense attorneys, Rich Ingram. The obvious damage is to the floor, especially the area directly under the driver's seat. After six weeks of holding to their story that the bomb was behind her, the police finally conceded that it was completely under her seat. That meant that Barry and Cherney might not have known the bomb was in the car. Why they originally contended that it was first on the back seat and then on the floorboard is because I think when they arrived at the scene, they already had a conclusion. The conclusion was it was Daryl and Judy's bomb. They misled uh, the public, they misled the courts because they put this in search warrant affidavit sworn under penalty of perjury. Clearly that was a falsehood, among many falsehoods that they continued to make in this case. The other evidence the police thought they had involved nails. Finishing nails like this one were taped to the outside of the pipe bomb. In his affidavit, Sergeant Chenault states that FBI agent Frank Doyle Jr. told him the nails on the bomb were identical to nails found in a bag in Barry's car. As a lawyer, I said, this is an exaggeration. Why are they exaggerating? And the only conclusion I could come to was that they were exaggerating because they had no evidence. The police sent the nails they had already claimed were identical to the FBI crime lab in Washington for study and comparison. Then they searched Barry's house in Mendocino County, where she worked as a carpenter. Here they found a box of finishing nails, and they also sent a sample of these to the crime lab. The result, according to Sergeant Michael Sitterud, was that FBI bomb expert David Williams said he could testify that the nails found in Barry's house and the bomb nails were made by the same machine within a batch of 200 to 1,000 nails. Police promptly told the press. The new information looked bad for Barry and Cherney, but there was a problem with what the police were claiming. Nails are mass-produced in large batches. A wire is fed into a machine where it is cut. In a split second, the machine stamps the head of the nail and shapes the point. The gripper holding the wire leaves marks which can be matched. But that doesn't really help investigators, according to Bay Area nail manufacturer Terry Townsend. Depending on the size of the nail, we can make anywhere from 1,200 to 1,400 nails a minute. Uh, then you have an eight-hour day shift, uh, and it would take probably three or four or five weeks uh, before the gripper dies would actually wear out, where you'd have to replace them. And most of those nails within that period of time could be identified as coming from the same machine. But then you're talking really millions of nails. Literally, I don't have a calculator with me, but multiply that all out, and you're probably getting millions of nails. Without being able to match nails more precisely, the Oakland police did not have a strong case. That's why on July 17th, nearly two months after the bomb exploded, the district attorney decided not to press charges. The FBI now acknowledges their nail evidence was inconclusive. Uh, I think you can tell from the status of the case, namely still pending, still open, that neither that nor any other type of physical evidence that we have is absolutely uh, definitive or conclusive. And so we haven't reached any conclusion or definition yet as to who did it. Um, and our mind is still open. Well, I've never been in a case where they were so eager to announce that they had the evidence, they were positive, they had matching duct tape, they had matching nails, um, and then have to take it all back. The police have stopped talking about the evidence. They now say they can't comment on a case that's still open. Uh, can you describe this bomb in any way to us? I mean, we know I can't. Okay, all right. Uh, was there a timer? I can't describe how the bomb was built. It doesn't reveal much, but this is a police mock-up of the bomb, showing a pipe mounted on a wooden board. Private investigator Sheila O'Donnell researched the bomb for Barry and Cherney's lawyers. Our understanding is that it was, there was a, an actual pipe with two ends screwed on, there was a clock, uh, a watch face, and there was a, um, an electrical circuit, which was a light switch. 
And my understanding is that when the clock ran, the face ran, it then kicked over, it tripped a switch so that the bomb was now set to go off with motion. So as soon as Judy hit anything at all, the car exploded. Exactly how the motion control device worked is unclear. Court documents only describe a ball bearing, a light socket, and wires. But the mechanism apparently prevented the bomb from detonating until it was jarred or shaken. The court records also reveal that the main part of the bomb consisted of an 11-inch piece of galvanized pipe. It was packed with an explosive mixture of potassium chlorate and aluminum powder. Nails were taped to the outside of the bomb. There was a light switch and a 9-volt Duracell battery to provide the electrical charge. The timer was a cheap bullseye pocket watch. And we also know that the bomb succeeded in part in exploding, but it failed in part. The full force of the bomb did not actually emanate from the center of the bomb. It actually blew out from one of the caps through Judy's uh, side door. Um, and that's one of the reasons that Judy is alive and that uh, Daryl wasn't hurt as seriously as Judy. Had that bomb exploded in its full force and effect, it would have killed, clearly killed both Judy and Daryl. Oh my God. That was, that's when, really that was when I really almost lost it and that's when my parents showed up. Barry spent two months in the hospital with her leg in traction. At the same time, she had to contend with a barrage of police, FBI, and press reports implicating her in the bombing. Yeah, this was a, a pretty horrible thing. While I was lying in a hospital, you know, terrified and in, in excruciating pain and wondering whether I was going to be put in jail and not get to raise my children, to have to read this kind of just day after day slamming in the press what was just it was just another element of the horror so I, I think that the press was despicable last summer after she was released from the hospital Barry attended a rally at the federal building in San Francisco to protest the way the FBI was handling the case but the FBI denies it is targeting Earth First in Northern California. Now, we're not investigating Earth First. Uh, I'd, I'd say more than half the people in the FBI office in San Francisco are ardent environmentalists themselves. Uh, so uh, they'd blow the whistle if we were investigating environmentalists, and I wouldn't blame them. I'd be at the head of the line. Uh, uh, we're not uh, seeking to deter environmentalists. Uh, but bombers, that's another thing. Uh, Anytime a bomb goes off, that's an incident we investigate. Uh, we don't care who did it. We're going to find out who did it. The FBI insists it has no political bias against Earth First, but KQED has obtained Freedom of Information Act documents showing that the FBI has been monitoring Earth First for a decade, almost from its very inception. The real extent of FBI monitoring of Earth First became apparent in 1989 when three Earth Firsters tried to knock down this power line in the Arizona desert. The man helping them was an undercover FBI agent, Michael Fain. The next day, the FBI also arrested Earth First leader Dave Foreman and charged him with conspiracy. The FBI's year-long $2 million undercover operation involved extensive wiretapping. And one of the FBI's own tapes suggests that the Bureau was out to get Foreman. So this really isn't the guy we need to pop, I mean, in terms of actual perpetrator. This is the guy we need to pop to send a message. I think they are back to their old uh, J. Edgar Hoover type intimidation of, of political activists. In the Arizona case, the FBI had an agent who worked for some time underground. He'd infiltrated Earth first. Do you have an agent in Earth First in Northern California? Well, we wouldn't discuss it if we did. But if, if anyone's paranoid uh, because of the FBI's activities, then I would suggest to you that the reason they're paranoid is because there are criminal activities involved. Does the FBI consider Earth First a terrorist organization? We wouldn't seek to characterize the organization at all. Prior to this bombing, do you have any evidence that Judy Berry was involved in any kind of terrorist act? Uh, as I told you, we did not have any investigative interest in Judy Barry. So to your knowledge, she was clean before this bombing? That's right. And Daryl Cherney? 
we didn't have any information that he was involved in terrorist acts either. I don't think there was a large conspiracy which existed prior to this to frame Judy and Darrell. But I think it was kind of, I think they were kind of, uh, they were made for each other, the Oakland police and the FBI, um, in, in this circumstance. It's easy to solve a crime if you can point to a group. It's much harder to figure out who did this, as you're finding out. Um, I mean, people have likened it to a needle in a haystack. Who in the world, I mean, who did this? Our search for the bomber began with a sinister letter signed, The Lord's Avenger. Aside from the bomb itself, the letter is one of the very few pieces of hard evidence in the case. It was sent five days after the bombing to Mike Janella, a reporter for the Santa Rosa Press Democrat. It is written in hellfire and brimstone language and is peppered with biblical quotes. It says that Judy Berry is possessed by the devil, and the Lord told me the demon must be struck down. I actually opened it and read it, and to be honest, I uh, remember saying to myself, oh, I mean, uh, now we've got the real nuts involved. And I actually put the letter aside for a minute and turned around and started writing, uh, finishing a story I was doing, but it was that brief, like, a minute, two minutes, and I thought, God, this letter describes a bomb. And it not only describes a bomb, but it describes a second bomb. And then it was that kind of the adrenaline pumping going, this is, whatever this is, someone knows something about this. The Lord's Avenger claims credit not only for the bomb in Barry's car, but also for another pipe bomb. This one was left at a Louisiana Pacific lumber mill in Cloverdale, California, just two weeks before the car bombing. Both bombs are described accurately in a no-nonsense writing style that stands out from the religious rhetoric in the rest of the letter. We paid a visit to the Cloverdale Mill where the first bomb was found. The bomb was placed on the front porch of a wooden office building near the front entrance. When the bomb was discovered the next morning, Sonoma County Sheriff's Detective Rich McComber was called to examine the evidence. What was very unusual about this, of course, was the presence of the gasoline as well. That, that's somewhat unusual. The bomb was intended to penetrate a gas can and set the building ablaze. Because a cap blew off the end, the bomb caused little damage and didn't attract much attention. One possible clue to the identity of the bomber is a cardboard sign that was left propped against a nearby tree. The Lord's Avenger says he intended the Cloverdale bomb to be blamed on Judy Berry. When that approach failed, the letter says, the Lord told me use not in direction. I put the bomb in her car. After examining both bombs, the FBI concluded that the same individual or individuals or different individuals utilizing the same set of instructions built both. The Lord's Avenger letter may hold the key to this case. Whoever wrote it has intimate inside knowledge of the Cloverdale bomb and the car bomb. The Lord's Avenger says he tried to kill Judy Berry because she supports abortion. He refers to a baby-killing clinic where he saw Satan's flame shoot from her mouth, eyes, and ears. At this Planned Parenthood clinic in Ukiah, California, Barry was involved in a heated confrontation with anti-abortion activists a year and a half before the bombing. A group of angry protesters were trying to stop the clinic from opening, and Barry organized a counter-demonstration. Her tactics enraged the leader of the anti-abortion rally, former Louisiana Pacific mill worker and born-again Christian Bill Staley. My statistics tell me that 100% of the ladies that have abortions have some kind of difficulty down the road. Maximum difficulty is nightmares of their saline saluted baby coming out of a garbage can. Awesome picture. At six foot three, 240 pounds, Staley can be an intimidating physical presence. He was a college All-American football player and former defensive tackle for the Chicago Bears. But Judy Berry wasn't daunted by Staley's size. There was um, 
a whole lot of noise coming out of Judy Berry and her she had a bullhorn and she was um, spouting all kinds of very gross things they had a they had a a little choir they put together with songs of that would make a normal person sick and they were singing them uh, with glee and revelry Bridget had two kids already and that abortion is what she chose the Christian showed her a bloody fetus she said that's fine I'll have one outrageous at this demonstration in retrospect I probably would have done it differently but um, because of the way that they were acting we decided if they were gonna be bullies we'd show them what what their tactics were like I remarked to other members of the press who were also there that I thought that the anti-abortion people were very scary people and when Judy Barry and Daryl got out of their car walked into the middle of these people I was apprehensive for her, for her safety in fact, the local Christian Action Council agreed to join Staley's demonstration only after he promised to be nonviolent. Planned Parenthood had already complained to police that Staley was trespassing and harassing employees. They said that I told the young lady that I was going to rape her so that she would have to have an abortion. And uh, she called the police. And I didn't do that. Troy. No formal charges were ever filed against Staley. There's no doubt Staley sees Barry as an evil force. But he denies trying to bomb her and says he is not the Lord's Avenger. If I had written the letter, I, I you know, um, I would have uh, had it much more biblically based and reason and logic but it didn't seem to have any of those real qualities of, of presenting the, some of the sensitive issues on abortion. So you, you're not the Lord's Avenger? I am not. And After the bombing, the FBI questioned Staley and asked him for a writing sample. They refused to comment on what they learned but they have not eliminated anti-abortion extremists as suspects. Our minds are open to any possibility. You haven't found a Lord's Avenger, though. Well, if we have, we don't have sufficient evidence to bring it into court yet. KQED's investigation turned up someone else at the Planned Parenthood rally with suspicious connections to Judy Berry's bombing, a man named Irv Sutley. Sutley is an admitted gun enthusiast. He's a Sonoma County political activist, a member of the Peace and Freedom Party, and a former member of the Communist Party. We interviewed him for this program, but he refused to appear on camera. We obtained these photographs of him from Pam Davis, an Earth First member and close friend of Judy Berry. Davis used to rent a room in her house to Sutley until he pointed a gun at her. Not only did he point it at me, but it was loaded. And it, it was like that, at that point, if there'd been any questions about him before, just in terms of my not trusting him and feeling not safe and secure with him, you know, that just capped it. I just, you know, he's not willing Sutley to... Sutley denies to pointing the gun at Davis. But back in November 1988, Davis and Sutley were still friends. They attended the abortion rally together, and after the rally, they went to visit Barry and Cherney at Cherney's home. I believe it was shortly after we got there that, um, Irv Sutley took, he had, he has a variety of guns and took his guns that he had brought with him out of the trunk of his car. And he pulls out a, um, what appears to be an Uzi. He uh, tells us that it's a semi-automatic and that it's legal and he asks us if we'd like to hold it. I don't remember who suggested it, but somebody thought it would be funny if we posed with it. We were trying to find a cover for Daryl's album 
They sure don't make hippies like they used to, and we thought that that would be a funny cover. But when the bomb went off in Barry's car a year and a half later, one of the Uzi photos suddenly appeared in all the major Bay Area newspapers, implying that Barry was armed and dangerous. First we got bombed, then we got framed, then the Lord's Avenger comes out with his letter, and now this Uzi photograph appears, and this thing's really started to stink pretty badly. It sure seemed like somebody was trying to set us up big time. And certainly the name Irv Sutley came immediately to mind because he already had the track record of having mailed this photograph out to at least the Anderson Valley Advertiser. Irv Sutley did send one of the Uzi photos to the Anderson Valley Advertiser, an irreverent Mendocino County newspaper published by Bruce Anderson. I remember coming home at one point and Irv coming up to me and saying, oh, I took one of the photos and mailed it to Bruce Anderson, the Anderson Valley Advertiser. Thought we could get it published, thought it'd be a lot of fun. The advertiser ran the photo as a joke. KQED has learned that someone sent another photo from the same roll of film to the Ukiah police. The police kept it in their files until Barry's car exploded. And so I took the photograph, made copies of it, and distributed it to all the local law enforcement agencies. KQED has also discovered that whoever sent the photo to the police sent this letter with it, offering to inform on Earth First and Judy Berry. It contains accurate, detailed information about Berry's political activities, but it also falsely accuses her of taking part in automatic weapons training. It offers to help police arrest her on marijuana charges. Our research indicates that when the letter was written, only two people had access to the photo and knew enough about Barry to write the letter, Irv Sutley and Pam Davis. Any idea where this letter came from? I have no idea. You didn't write it? I didn't write it. Irv Sutley also denies writing the letter, and he says he did not send the photograph to the police. Have you ever seen this letter before? Personally, I haven't, no. All right. So you don't know whether the FBI has this in its possession or not? No, but uh, the FBI might be interested in having it, so uh, I'd All be right. happy to accept a copy from you. Neither the police nor the FBI have talked to Sutley about the Uzi photo or the letter, and they have never questioned Pam Davis. Another disturbing aspect of the letter is that the address on the envelope bears a striking resemblance to the address on one of the most serious threats Barry received before the bombing. A threat that ended, you won't get a second warning. We continued our search for the bomber by returning to the Lord's Avenger letter. In addition to focusing on abortion, the letter mentions a more obvious source of contention, timber. The letter accuses Judy Berry of being a pagan who spreads the satanic message that trees are gods and it's a sin to cut them. In Northern California's Mendocino and Humboldt counties, timber is the foundation of the local economy. The region's awe-inspiring redwood forests are also the focus of an emotional battle between environmentalists who want to protect them and loggers afraid of losing their jobs. In August 1989, Judy Berry and Daryl Cherney organized a week of Earth First protests that included blockading roads to stop logging trucks. The week culminated with a march and rally outside the Georgia Pacific Lumber Company in Fort Bragg. But Barry and Cherney never made it to the demonstration. On their way there, her car was struck by a logging truck, the same one she blockaded the previous day. 
My children were in the car, some other Earth First organizers were in the car, and um, my car was totaled, turned into an accordion, and we were all sent to the hospital. And they refused to investigate it as anything but a traffic accident, despite photographic evidence that we showed them to prove that it was the same truck. And I think that what was happening was a real pattern of non-enforcement of law in, uh, regarding Earth Firsters. And um, what this did was it gave a green light to anybody who would attack us. In response to escalating tensions, Earth First devised a new tactic, a Redwood Summer campaign based on the civil rights movement's Mississippi Summer of the early 1960s. The plan was to attract thousands of people to Northern California to save the Redwoods. Barry convinced her friends and allies in California to renounce tree spiking. She also initiated a non-violence code for all Redwood Summer protesters. But someone was intent on showing that Earth First was bent on violence. Fake Earth First press releases declaring war against timber companies appeared at logging mills. Once Redwood Summer was announced, the threats against Barry became more personal and vicious. So I took this to the Mendocino County Sheriff's and um, Two of them, um, Sergeant Satterwhite and um, I, I guess he's Lieutenant Burrow Murray, um, stood there in front of four witnesses. And when I asked them to investigate the death threats, they said, we don't have the manpower to investigate. If you turn up dead, then we'll investigate. KQED contacted Sergeant Satterwhite. He refused to confirm or deny making the statement. This is a photograph of me Xerox from a newspaper with a rifle scope over my head. Probably the person who sent it is in this room. There's also been literally... When the Mendocino County Board of Supervisors convened to discuss what to do about Redwood Summer, tempers flared. It's because in addition to the very deliberate misinformation and hate campaign I see being stirred up against us, um, I also feel very strongly that the Mendocino... Please let me... Either you shut up or I'm leaving. Well, then please leave now and goodbye. We all enjoy it. Are you going to control the mic? I have one more thing to say about the National Guard and the police. I'm not. I'm not. I'm really out of order. You know, there's a lot of things going on besides what Earth First is doing. They want to demonstrate peacefully. More power to them. But the first guy that comes on my property and damages a piece of our equipment or endangers one of my employees, the shit's going to hit the fan. I'm sorry to say that, but I mean it. Thank you. Talk is cheap, but I heard everything from I heard everything from out and out murder to to torture. In an exclusive interview, retired well, I, logger Ed Knight told I KQED he and his friends were looking forward to a confrontation with monkey wrenchers. There was a general consensus among the logging community that if anybody was caught spiking a tree, uh, driving the railroad spike a long nail in or something, uh, they'd just crucify them. They'd take the tree to town, uh, the tree'd go to town with uh, whoever was caught red-handed. It was, it was like um, vigilantism in its worst, or would have been. Knight says he was offered money and guns to guard logging equipment against Earth First sabotage. Who's making these offers then? I, 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 can't, I can't say who's making these offers. Uh, logging, logging companies, JIPOs? Uh, JIPOs, basically, but by JIP, small contractors, the ones that have the most to lose. Off camera, Knight named Steve Okerstrom as one of the independent logging contractors who were hiring armed guards. Okerstrom told KQED he was worried about his equipment and he did hire guards, but they were armed only with two-way radios and were instructed to avoid confrontation. I'm a businessman, he told us. It wasn't worth blood. Of all the independent contractors in the area, Okerstrom probably had the most to lose from equipment sabotage. He had recently purchased a very expensive and highly controversial piece of machinery called a feller buncher, a machine Earth First despised. 
what it does is it grabs the trees and it has a little chainsaw on it and knocks them down. I've watched these things in operation. They move so quickly and do so much damage. They destroy the forest as well as taking the workers' jobs away. This, this machine can cut between 500 and 1,000 trees in a day's time. So in one sense, if you want to look at it, this machine could replace 10 people. Where are we going? logging fair in Ukiah in March 1990, Okerstrom displayed his brand new feller buncher, worth about $700,000. Earth First staged a noisy demonstration against it. I'll tell you what, they've taken the old growth and they've taken the second growth and now they're taking the baby trees. No, what is the not life? accurate. Well, yes it is. I've seen it. I've seen these goddamn things. Where? Tell they me take where. I'm not telling you where. Are you kidding? I've seen them lying. Well, I'd like them arrest them if you possibly could. Okay, if you want to arrest them for trespassing on private you property, you can have to place them under citizen's arrest. Okay, you are under citizen's arrest. Okay. A few weeks after the Ukiah demonstration, Okerstrom's feller buncher caught fire at a work site in the forest. It was repaired, but before the end of the year, it burned again and was entirely destroyed. I don't know what started the fires. I really don't. But I know there wasn't a whole lot of effort put into checking to see what it was. I know they spent a whole lot more time trying to figure out what happened to the back end of Judy Berry. Police and insurance investigators say there was no evidence of sabotage in either fire. What I have done is regard to his fellow bunchers is I, every time that one of them burned, I did make, make snotty comments about him in the newspaper. And so that is probably a reason why um, he particularly blames me in some way or another, but we had nothing to do with us burning those machines, and he knows it. After the bomb went off in Barry's car, some people in Earth First suspected Steve Okerstrom. Once they said that we knew you were the cause of the bombing of Judy Barry, and uh, you will pay with your life. Barry denies knowing anything about the threats to Steve Okerstrom, and she told the Willits News, in case there is a distorted person out there who thinks they're doing this on my behalf, please stop. Okerstrom despises Earth First, but says he had nothing to do with the bomb in Judy Barry's car. effort to defuse the tension and hostility surrounding Redwood Summer, Barry agreed to hold a series of behind-the-scenes talks with independent loggers. The meetings took place at a restaurant in the town of Willits, about 125 miles north of San Francisco. It was here, during the second of these meetings, that the Lord's Avenger claims to have put the bomb in Barry's car, a day and a half before it went off. Barry agreed to help us retrace her steps from this point to the explosion. During the meeting, Barry's car was parked directly across the street from the Willits Police Department and right next to the restaurant. It's possible the Lord's Avenger slipped the bomb into her car during the meeting, but it would have been risky. It's also unlikely that the timing mechanism could have delayed the bomb for more than 36 hours. It's possible the timer malfunctioned, which is what the Lord's Avenger claims. About nine o'clock, Barry left the restaurant with three friends. She drove back to her house in nearby Redwood Valley. At home, Barry played music with her friends and went to sleep. Her car was parked outside all night. This was another opportunity for someone to plant the bomb. Would you normally lock your car? No. I, I, I mean, you know, that's why I live in the country. It was definitely unlocked. The next morning, Barry packed up her fiddle and her files and drove south to join Daryl Cherney in Berkeley. They were planning to go on a tour of colleges to recruit students for Redwood Summer.
On the way, Barry stopped in Ukiah for a press conference. It's not likely the bomb was placed here, since her car was locked and parked in broad daylight on a well-traveled street. She arrived in Berkeley around 6 and went to this house to meet Cherney. They discussed plans for Redwood Summer with a local group called Seeds of Peace. Barry's car was parked and locked across the street. I was very nervous in Mendocino County because I had been receiving so many death threats and the tensions were so high and I felt relieved to be away, to be in the city where I thought I was safer. The meeting ended sometime after 11 p.m. Before she left, Barry spoke with a local activist she had met a couple of times before, a man named David Chemnitzer. I mentioned to Judy that I had a spare room and if she needed a place to crash that evening, since Seeds was so crowded. Barry followed Chemnitzer to his house in Oakland, about 10 minutes away. She left her car parked and locked in front of the house all night. The next morning, Daryl Cherney and a woman named Shannon Marr met Barry at Chemnitzer's house. A few hours later, they headed back to Berkeley. Cherney rode with Barry in her car, and Shannon Marr led the way. Shannon took off rather quickly, and Judy and I were talking about how fast Shannon was driving and how hard it was to keep up with her. Following Shannon Marr, Barry pulled her car quickly into the left lane and then stopped short. A short time later, David Chemnitzer arrived on the scene. When he identified himself to the Oakland police, they locked him in a squad car and then took him in for questioning. They searched his house for explosives. They took a little plastic tool kit which contained my daughter's stained glass making equipment, including a soldering gun and some copper foil and wire. And my wife had used the uh, um, soldering gun to fix a lamp so it had a little switch in it and all that stuff and they thought that was a bomb making kit the oakland police have told kqed they no longer consider chemnitzer a suspect in the case chemnitzer denies having anything to do with the bomb in barry's car i mean i was around during a period when there was a lot more violence in the movement and i participated in a certain amount of that but even at that time, I wasn't into bombs. I wasn't into jokes about bombs, you know. While Chemnitzer may have had the opportunity to place a bomb in Barry's car, our research turned up no evidence that he did. But someone attempted to pin the blame on David Chemnitzer, along with Daryl Cherney. They were named in a pair of anonymous letters sent to the press and the DA's office shortly after the bombing. These so-called Zorro letters are filled with wild speculation and false accusations. Anna Marie Stenberg, a close friend and political ally of Barry's, thinks she knows who wrote the letters. When those letters were presented to me, I, I can't tell you how I felt. I mean, it was just awful. I mean, there's my best friend blown up by a bomb, and his, I mean, it was real clear to me that Michael wrote those letters. Michael is Michael Kepf, Anna Marie Stenberg's ex-husband. Kepf, a former Green Beret, currently teaches journalism at a small local college. He is also a published novelist. One of his political thrillers, Icarus, contains numerous descriptions of homemade bombs. Anna Marie Stenberg says she immediately recognized his writing style in the Zorro letters. KQED interviewed Michael Kepf, but he would not appear on camera. He denied writing the letters. But Anna Marie Stenberg remains convinced that Kep wrote the Zorro letters. Though she has no hard evidence, she also fears he might be the bomber. It's too overwhelming to think about somebody that I was married to having anything to do with it, but I can't rule them out. I just can't. At the time of the bombing, Stenberg and Kep were going through a bitter divorce. She obtained a restraining order against him after she kicked him out of the house, claiming he had threatened her life. According to Stenberg, Kep blamed the divorce on her close relationship with Judy Berry. 
after Kep moved out, Stenberg says she discovered an Army field manual, very similar to this one, left in one of his drawers. I opened up and looked at either side of the page, and there was a picture of, a, of, of some kind of bomb exploding in a car on one side of the page, and on the other side of the page, some kind of bomb exploding uh, by a lumber yard. Stenberg turned the bomb manual into the Fort Bragg police, along with a gun which had belonged to Kep. Police confirm this. Kep agrees that he had the gun, but denies knowing anything about the bomb manual. He says he did not bomb the Cloverdale lumber mill, and he did not bomb Judy Berry. Kep also told KQED that the FBI questioned him soon after the bombing. He says he told the FBI he suspected Barry and Cherney and his ex-wife, Anna Marie Stenberg. They look suspicious to me, he said. The FBI also talked to Judy Barry's ex-husband, Michael Sweeney. We were married for eight years, and we have two children. And um, uh, we kind of went different directions. He's considerably more conservative and less active than I am. And um, there were just irreconcilable differences in our marriage, so we got divorced. At the time of their divorce in 1988, they were in the process of building a house on this property in Redwood Valley. After they split up, they both continued to live here. Barry and their two daughters in the converted garage, and Sweeney in the trailer. The second time the FBI searched the property, they went through Sweeney's trailer. The FBI refused to comment specifically about Sweeney, but they didn't rule him out as a suspect. You know that in this state that homicides are most often committed by relatives or friends of the victim? I do know that. Well, we, that's something that the Oakland PD knows too, and it's something that we're very familiar with. Sweeney adamantly refused to talk to us despite repeated requests. He's trying to be respectable and disassociate himself from me, and um, he's, I guess he just doesn't want the publicity. These days, Sweeney promotes recycling in Mendocino County and writes a column for the Ukiah Daily Journal. When he and Barry met, they were both involved in radical union politics. In 1979, they moved to this house in Santa Rosa, California. The house was located near an old Navy airfield that was built during the Second World War. Since then, it's been used by student pilots and private plane owners. Sweeney and Barry led neighborhood opposition to the airport's expansion plans. Just prior to this campaign, in October 1980, someone set fire to the airfield. The main hangar that our offices were in was engulfed in flame. Our, our flight instructor woke up. It, it was almost murder because this was arson. And our flight instructor woke up with his camper in flames and just barely got out with his life. KQED has obtained police and fire department records showing that the arson was an elaborate affair triggered by a Kmart timer. Now, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of feet of wiring with electronic fuses surrounded by volatile materials, some, in some cases just soaked gasoline rags, uh, but stretching throughout both hangars and right into the underground fuel dump. Police never solved the case, but Williams has long suspected Sweeney and Barry because of their vocal opposition to the airfield. In a letter to KQED, Sweeney denies having anything to do with the arson. Barry also denies involvement. But Bob Williams has a very definite reason for revenge. And this is just another outrageous charge trying to make us appear to be violent when in fact we're nonviolent. Judy Barry has been forthcoming and honest with KQED throughout our investigation but several others close to her have told us that she knows more about Michael Sweeney's alleged involvement in the arson fire than she has been willing to share with us. We have not uncovered enough evidence to solve the arson case.
When the bomb went off in Judy Berry's car, Bob Williams went to the FBI and told them he suspected there was a link between the arson case and the car bombing, but he has no evidence. In a letter to KQED, Sweeney emphatically denies having anything to do with the car bombing. He adds, I would never have wanted anything to happen to Judy that would have put the whole responsibility for raising our daughters on me alone. Sweeney claims he and Barry lived next door to one another amicably for more than two years after their divorce. Barry had told us there was a lot of tension between her and Sweeney during this same period, and he had often been cold and hostile. When Barry learned KQED planned to mention Sweeney in this documentary, she sent us this videotape denial. No, there's no way that Mike Sweeney was the bomber. I was targeted for political, not personal reasons. Mike and I may have been divorced, but we had a friendly divorce. We shared the children, and in fact, he was taking care of the children the nights when both bombs were planted. There is no way that Mike Sweeney tried to kill the mother of his children. Today, Judy Berry lives in her own cabin deep in the hills of Mendocino County. She refuses to back down in her fight to save the Redwoods. At the same time, she says she sympathizes with rank-and-file loggers. Mills are closing down, people are being laid off, having short shifts all over. And I think that these people have a very legitimate fear. I don't know where they're going to go, and I don't know what they're going to do. I think next year is going to be horrendous because next year the loggers are going to be out of work and they're going to look for somebody to blame. This year it was kind of fun. Nobody got hurt. With a new logging season about to begin and tensions rising once more, a Humboldt County supervisor warned recently somebody is going to get killed. Unfortunately, many of these laid off workers do blame us. And I think that there's actually a physical danger from that because I think that um, people are being incited to hatred and violence against us as they were before Redwood Summer. Barry is most disturbed that the bomber is still at large and the official investigations appear stalled. But the FBI insists it is determined to solve the case. The public can help us to collect evidence to find out the truth here about what happened. And there are still people out there who probably know things about this incident, uh, uh, who we would like to talk to about it. One year after the car bombing, the case remains unsolved. Leads have grown cold. Unless there is an aggressive, unbiased investigation by police and federal law enforcement agencies, we may never learn who bombed Judy Berry. It's the world of boom and bust But we'll answer with non-violence For seeking justice is our plan And we'll avenge our own comrades And we defend the ravaged land So ask it out! It's bringing people and work together helping individuals to explore, develop, and advance their careers on the web at jvs.org. Support for closed captioning on this program was provided by the Fireman's Fund Foundation. The following is a KQED television production. Who bombed Judy Berry? Twelve years later, the case against the FBI goes to trial. We'll have explosive new evidence. As scandals rock the Catholic Church nationwide, District Attorney Hallinan asked for 75 years of records from the San Francisco Archdiocese. San Francisco's Levi Strauss is closing its historic factory, succumbing to the globalization of the garment industry. What do you do when your broker recommends stocks he knows are bad investments? Merrill Lynch is under investigation. Those stories next. Davis and welcome to This Week in Northern California. 
If you have questions for tonight's reporters, go to our webpage at thisweek.kqed.org and follow the directions there. Please remember to make your questions brief and send them to us as early as possible. Our guest reporters tonight are Steve Talbot, documentary filmmaker and series editor for Frontline World. Rita Williams, reporter with KTVU-TV in Oakland. Steve Ginsberg, a reporter with the San Francisco Business Times. And David Lazarus, columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle. It's been more than a decade since a bomb exploded in the car of Earth First activists Judy Berry and Daryl Cherney. The lawsuit they filed against the FBI and the Oakland police went to court this week. In 1991, the only suspects the FBI pursued were Berry and Cherney themselves, accusing them of being eco-terrorists. Cherney and Berry claimed innocence and questioned why there were no other suspects. So, Steve Talbot, you covered this story from the beginning. You've followed it since. What new evidence or information can you tell us about tonight? Well, basically what I want to tell you and the world tonight is something that I've kept a secret for 10 years, which has been an unsettling and strange experience for a journalist. I reported in the documentary in 1991 here on KQED that the FBI and the Oakland Police Department, I felt, really had made a rush to judgment on the case against um, Judy Berry and Daryl Cherney. And it's a kind of a minor miracle that they have gotten this case a decade later into court where they can debate that. But the issue that's still unresolved is who actually bombed Judy Berry? And that's not really being discussed in the case in Oakland right now, I'm afraid. And what I have to report is that Judy Berry, who I became quite close with. I had first written an article from Mother Jones about her, Mother Jones Magazine, and then done the documentary here. We became quite close, and about two-thirds of the way through making the documentary, she took me aside and confided that she was very fearful of her ex-husband, a man named Michael Sweeney. And she said that Sweeney had physically abused her, that he had raped her, and then she went on to say that in 1980, he had firebombed the Santa Rosa airfield. That was a fire that nearly killed a flight instructor who was in a hangar at the time that the blaze went off, caused over $200,000 in damage, 100, 200 foot flames. Um, one of the big old World War II hangars was destroyed. Judy Berry told me that Michael Sweeney constructed the bomb that set off that explosion in their house which was next to the Santa Rosa airfield, that she saw him do it, that she asked him not to do it, and that he went ahead and did it. She did not know, and I still do not know, who put that bomb in that car. But someone tried to kill her, and the secret that she took to her grave was that she thought it might be her ex-husband. And, and I never said that at the time, because she was a source. She told me that in confidence. And when the documentary came out, she denounced me for even hinting at some of this in the program. And I couldn't defend myself. And a lot of people said, why don't you just say what, you know, what's going on? People here at KQED. I said, no, I can't do that. Journalists play by certain rules. She was a source. I can't say it. Now, she told this to my private investigator and co-producer on the program, David Helvarg. Also, some of her closest friends, part of her legal advisor team, um, and her political allies came to me at the time and said, we don't know for sure, but we are concerned about this guy, Michael Sweeney. You would be negligent not to pursue that investigation. Steve, was Sweeney implicated in these other incidents you're describing, and is he, is he under investigation now? He is not. As far as I know, he is not. He refused to talk to us. Of all the loggers, all the logging companies, all the suspects in this show that we investigated 10 years ago, every single person spoke to us except Michael Sweeney. Where is he now? He lives in the Mendocino area. I believe he's in Willits. Um, he used to, he runs a recycling business. Uh, he's lying very low now that the trial is on. And I want to emphasize, I do not know, and Judy did not know, who put the bomb in the car. I don't know if it was Michael Sweeney. But what I'm saying here tonight is that he is a person worthy of investigation by anyone who really wants to know who bombed Judy but Berry. But the facts Judy... too cold now? I meant the evidence gone? 
It's a problem, but there's one key to this case. Everyone, all sides agree, the FBI, the Oakland Police Department, Daryl Cherney, Barry's estate, her legal team, that the key to this case is something called the Lord's Avenger letter, which was an anonymous letter sent to Mike Janella, the Santa Rosa Press Democrat, saying, I claim that I did this bombing. It was written in kind of mock fundamentalist Christian rhetoric, said it was a person who was anti-abortion and had done the bombing because she was pro-choice. I investigated someone like that up there, a former football player, um, who I found probably had not done this. Um, anyway, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought there. <laughs> you had a question she's going to get. A in. couple of them. One of them is, did Judy Berry never tell authorities about her no. suspicions? And she never no did. one close to her, even after she died, ever told authorities that there was no, this possibility? No, and there are witnesses now appearing in that case in Oakland who have been on the stand this week, who know exactly what I'm telling you. But, but Earth first... And they haven't said it. And let me just finish, yeah. sorry, on this Lord's Avenger sure. letter. Because here, this still could be an answer to this case. Everyone says whoever wrote that Lord's Avenger letter knew who did the bombing or actually did do the bombing, because there's so many details about the construction of the bomb, the timing, and so forth. Everyone agrees on that. Barry's legal team, Gerald Cherney's legal team, did DNA sampling of that letter. The FBI gave them the original letter. They have that DNA sample. They say it's primarily a woman's saliva sample they, from that letter. They, they have analyzed that. They actually told us on Monday at the beginning of the trial uh, during a demonstration that the saliva met, uh, matched the DNA of a person known up in that area near Ukiah who was a pro-timber person. Um, and they claim that they have the name. Who told you this? Uh, Daryl Cherney. Uh huh. Okay. We'll see. But there are people you could match. Frontline last night, you know, runs documentaries about how DNA samples can prove people are innocent or not. You know, how you forcibly get someone to do a DNA sample is a big legal question. Steve, but does any there is of, that possible solution. Okay, does any of this, could any of this have an impact? on this trial going on now where the FBI and the police department is being sued. How does it relate to that? I honestly don't know. This case is being very narrowly focused on did the FBI and did the Oakland Police Department rush to judgment? Did they make a false arrest on very little evidence? And did they continue to defame Daryl Cherney and Judy Berry while ultimately all the charges were dropped as you may recall the DA decided not to prosecute so it's being tried it's an important case and the FBI and the Oakland Police Department should answer for what they did and try to justify it but it still is not answering the fundamental question of who actually tried to kill her this is so interesting I can see why you have followed it for more than a decade thank you very much Steve Talbot well, each day seems to bring new revelations.